Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real conversations that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. And boy, do we ever have that for you on this episode. As usual, we're sponsored by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com slash different. And while you're there, you'll be able to book a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. Check out netsuite.com slash different. On this episode, a true living legend, entrepreneur, leader, one of the greatest speakers of all time, and clearly one of the greatest authors of all time, and certainly one of the most important business authors of all time. He's probably most well-known for his seminal book, The One Minute Manager, which I read when I was very young, and it was one of a handful of books that made a giant difference to me. And he's written over 60 other books. Today we have none other than Dr. Ken Blanchard. And Ken's contributions and achievements are um, hard to put into context, but maybe this is one way to get give you a sense of how awesome Ken is. Um, he's been inducted into the Amazon Hall of Fame as one of the top 25 best-selling authors of all time. Think about that. <laughs> what an achievement. Anyway, it turns out he's a wonderful guy and... Um, it was a great experience for me to meet one of my heroes, and we have a conversation about why service comes from the heart, why legendary customer service matters so much. Um, he's got a, 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 an updated version, a new book out called The Simple Truths of Service, inspired by Johnny the Bagger. And uh, I highly recommend you pick this book up. It, it's going to make you feel good. It's going to give you a lot of insights, and it's another wonderful read by Ken. Um, in this conversation, we talk about how to be yourself, the power of true servant leadership. Ken also shares some of his secrets on how to be a legendary public speaker and writer, and he even gives us some tips on how to have a great marriage. Go to Lockhead.com for more. Check out the show notes and key takeaways from this episode. And now, hey-ho, let's go. So how are you, Ken? I'm doing just great. Just I'm so <laughs> glad to hear that. And uh, not to be too corny, but I, I, I have to say, I've just been a fan of yours pretty much since the time I was about 18 years old. Well, that's, that's great. I had a young kid come up to me recently. He said, my grandfather gave my father the woman a manager when he had his first job. And my father just gave me the woman a manager for my first job. <laughs> that's 35 years ago that when it came out. Wow. Yeah. Well, and what the one minute manager did for me, uh, I got thrown out of school at 18 for being a you know dummy. And uh, so with very few options, I started a company. And for me to learn, you know, for me to be successful, I because I had no experience, no education, no money, no relationships, I started at zero. You know, I had to learn by doing, learn by seeking out mentors and learn by reading. And you became a mentor of mine through your book. Yeah, And in specific, this is a big thing I wanted to thank you for. Um, in the beginning of my career, I didn't know how to focus. I didn't know what a result was. I didn't know how to get organized. I didn't know how I should conduct myself to be successful. And two of the books that I read um, that I put in the same class really helped me sort of f figure out how I should structure myself in terms of the way I do work. And one of them was Peter Drucker's The Effective Executive. Yes. And the other was your book. Uh -huh. And and that book was a huge gift to me. I have given it to many others as well. And I know you probably hear this all the time, but I can't thank you enough for writing. Well, it's uh, my uh, mission statement is to be a loving teacher, an example of simple truths. <laughs> and so that's what we try to do. And Spencer Johnson, who I wrote it with, wrote children's books before we wrote The Woman and Manager. So... <laughs> the woman manages this a kid, kid's book for big people. <laughs> well, and I just love, you know, and, and simplicity is really, uh, I don't know, you'll tell me, but at least as somebody who's consumed your work for decades now, a hallmark uh, of, of what you write and what you teach. Yeah, so try, try to, because it's really interesting <clears throat> about life. When I was in graduate school, all my professors said, if you want to be at universities, uh, 
you should be administrator because you couldn't write, <laughs> which I learned out later you could understand. And that was kind of confusing to them, you know, because professors don't like it to be really esoteric. <laughs> well, and it's funny that they, they, they said that. I'm going to grab it, see if I – yeah. So I was – you know, I knew, of course, your background. So I, I just this morning just checked the the bio on in your new book, uh, but I didn't feel like I had to. But as I was reading it, I, I, there was something in there that I did not realize. You've been named to Amazon's Hall of Fame as one of the top twenty five best selling authors of all time. Yeah, pretty amazing. Isn't it? <laughs> Unfortunate that you can't write, though. I know, I know. So. <laughs> That's because other people can understand it. I remember one time in a paper, we were supposed to use an analogy, and I said, that went over like a pregnant high jumper. And the president and the professor said, don't be, uh, you know, facetious. And I said, what does facetious mean? <laughs> oh, I love it. It's just fantastic. So, um, Listen, I'm happy to chat with you about anything you want. I do have some thoughts and questions I'd love to talk to you about with your new book. But is there any sure. in particular you'd like to start, Ken? No, I uh, Barbara Glanz, who I wrote uh, The Simple Truths of Service, she's a <clears throat> wonderful person. And she was working with a, uh, a uh, grocery chain, and she told them, every one of you can make a difference out there. To, tonight, think about how you can reach out to customers in this down syndrome kid Johnny, who was a beggar, went home and said to his father, you know, this woman said we could all make a difference. How am I going to make a difference? And so they thought and thought and they realized Johnny loves sayings. And so they took one of his favorite sayings and and Xeroxed, uh, you know, 150 or 200 copies of it and, and cut them out. And Johnny signed them and and had him in a bag, and he would say, after bagging somebody's grocery, here, I want you to have my thought for the day. And it just changed the whole store, and people were lined up to get Johnny's thought for the day. And, and so it's just uh, interesting is that you don't have to do anything complicated, but just to reach out to customers and, and show them that they're important to you. I, I love the story, and in a lot of ways, this this book feels like a, a love letter to Johnny, right? Yes, it is. yeah. And uh, are you familiar <clears throat> at all, Ken, with um, a company called John's Crazy Socks? No, I don't think I am. Uh, I would love you to know them. Uh, I'll introduce you if you're interested. It may be the greatest entrepreneurial story I've heard ever, but certainly one of them. And I had John and his father, Mark, on, on the podcast a while ago. And uh, when John graduated high school, his dad said to him, hey, what do you want to do? And his dad had... Uh, done many entrepreneurial things in the past. And he said, Dad, I want to start a business with you. And John's a very creative young guy. And, um, and so they started this company called John's Crazy Socks, where they have all these kind of snazzy, jazzy sock designs. And John has Down syndrome. Uh -huh. And one of the powerful things that uh, Mark said when they were both with me on my podcast was that one of the reasons they had to create the company was – that like a lot of entrepreneurs, there was nobody that was going to give John a job that was going to allow him to fulfill his potential. Sure. And their, their mission is, to, they say, to spread happiness with socks. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen some of those socks. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you might have seen. Um, George H.W. wore a pair of uh, John's crazy socks to his wife Barbara's funeral because they have a, they have a literacy sock that they've now dedicated to Barbara Bush. Um, and so John's Crazy Socks rose to some fame because of that. Oh, wow. Isn't that something? I think Barbara Bush was really quite a wonderful person. She would give it to you straight. <laughs> did, did you know her at all? No, I didn't, but I just admired her from a yeah, distance. As did I. So with your new book, I'd love to start with the final chapter, if I could. If, sure. Start at the end, um, because... Even just glancing the book's chapters, you know, I like to open a book and, and look at the chapter titles to just so, sort of get a sense of what's up. And I actually read the final chapter first because the title captured me so much. Uh, the final truth, great service comes from the heart. Could, could you unpack that for me a little? Well, I think that what that really means is that uh, 
if you're just putting on a show because somebody says, you know, say, uh, you know, please to help you or something like that, it's not in your heart. It comes off phony, you know. <clears throat> but if it's really in your heart, that really makes it makes a, a difference, you know. And uh, uh, for example, I wrote a book with Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick Fil A, and and they uh, spend a lot of time hiring their young people, and they say to them, you know you probably won't spend your career here, but we're going to teach you skills that are going to make you a better spouse, a better friend, a better parent, a better citizen. And, and, uh, and they really are uh, just teach the quantifying kids who have a heart to serve other people. And boy, that makes a difference. Yeah, it, it sure does. And so um, if I'm somebody who wants to be kind of a heart centered service person, if I could put it in those terms, um, what advice would you give me? Well, the big question that we ask with the heart is, uh, are you here to serve or be served? And uh, the thing that keeps you from doing that, because I ask people all the time uh, in sessions, you know, how many of you would like to be known as a self-serving leader versus a servant leader? Of course, nobody puts their hands up. I said, but how come uh, sometimes you, you get off of track? But it's because the human ego we've uh, developed, you get a kick out of a 12-step egos anonymous uh, program, you know, because uh, that's the biggest addiction in the world. And there's two ways your ego get in the way. One is false pride when you act like you're better than somebody else. You know, you're, you have a more than philosophy. And the other one that's interesting is uh, fear or self-doubt where you have a less than philosophy. A lot of people say that's an ego problem. Sure, you're focused on yourself. And uh, so uh, I have a uh, lead like Jesus ministry, and that's where we really started this 12-step uh, goes and on. It's really kind of fun to see people at a meeting. We'll, we'll go in there. They have to stand up and say, hi, I'm Ken. You know, and everybody says, hi, Ken. And then you have to say, I'm an egomaniac. And the last time my ego got in the way was, you know, duh. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Now, I, I got to ask you, I mean, for yourself, if you don't mind getting a little personal. Yes. Uh, you're one of the greatest writers of all time. There's no doubt about that that you've been a celebrated, what today people would call thought leader or this word that I can't really stand, influencer. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but I would call you more of a teacher. That's my experience of you. Um, but re regardless of the term, there is no question that um, in the world of you know self-help, business, uh, leadership, personal growth, wh whatever words you want to put around the areas in which you work, you stand alone, Ken. And so it would be very easy in your position and all the awards and Amazon and all of it uh, for you to be a complete egomaniac. So <laughs> how do you stay grounded? <clears throat> well, number one, I had a really powerful mother and father, my Dad was a retired as an admiral in the Navy, and I'll never forget, I, I won the president of the seventh grade in junior high school in New Rochelle, New York, and I came home, and I'm all pumped up. And My dad says, well, Ken, here's the beginning of your leadership lessons. He said, now that you're president, uh, don't ever use your position. Great leaders are great because people respect and trust them, not because they have power. And then my mother, she, my kids kid me because my, this one finger, my pointing finger bends a little bit. And my mother, she, she would have that, her finger bent. And she said to me, now, don't you ever act like you're better than anybody else. But don't you let anybody else act like they're better than you. God didn't make any junk. So look for the pearl of goodness in everybody and you can find it. And uh, so, uh, you know, I kind of, then I have a fabulous wife, Margie, you know, I married way above myself and. If I ever start a little uppity, she'll just go, Ken, you know, and then my two kids, they work with us, you know, and they'll go, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so they'll, they'll whack you back in line if oh, required. For sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Now, what was your motivation in wanting to write yet another book? Well, it's fun, really. You know, my mother used to say to me, why don't you write a book by yourself? Because I've written over 60 and I've only written two by myself. One about golf. <clears throat> so many people helped my golf game. I didn't know who to write it with. And then the other one was my spiritual journey. And I didn't think I could co-author that one. And uh, but I just love to learn, 
you know, from people. And so I've just had a wonderful time. I mean, writing a book with Norman Vincent Peale when he was 86 years old, the great positive thinking and, and Don Shula, the great Miami Dolphins uh, uh, coach, and then Colleen Barrett, who stepped in to take over the presidency of Southwest when Herb decided to step down and just, just marvelous uh, people and a, and a bunch of our associates that work in our company. You know, I've uh, tried to bring them into projects and it's been just great working with, with them. So it's just a, life is a very special occasion, as I told you before we got on and I don't like to miss it. And one of the real special occasions is, is the people that are in the world. I, I just really feel that we're so creative as human beings. I don't know why we don't get along better, you know, and it's all ego stuff when you're trying to act like you're better than somebody or, or whatever, you know, and, uh, I think if we look for the pearl of goodness in each other, we find it no matter what our race or creed or color uh, is. And so uh, that's just my philosophy. That's fantastic. You know, one, one of the things that I look for um, in any person, but in particularly a supremely accomplished person in w- whatever domain or domains is, are they over themselves? You know, that is to say, are they a big deal for them? And um, it's amazing how many uh, truly legendary people have found a way to get over themselves, to not take themselves too seriously. Um, of course, we all know about the opposite, you know, famous or, or successful person. But in point of fact, you know, I've met and spent time with a lot of very successful, uh, in some cases, incredibly well-known people. Here I am with you. And, and, and yet you are over yourself. And why do you think that these successful people, in spite of their extraordinary achievements, um, can remain humble like that? Well, it's interesting, you know, when I run into a CEO who's a problem or manager is a problem in an organization, every time their, their problem is they, uh, if you remember Thomas Harris years ago wrote, I'm okay, you're okay. He said the worst life position is I'm okay, you're not but he said that all the research shows that those people were really covering up not okay feelings about themselves. They're scared little kids inside. And, you know, uh, uh, the key to overcome all of that is humility. And I remember Jim Collins, when he wrote Good to Great, and uh, they came out in the research that showed two characteristics of great leaders. One is resolve, which is determination to accomplish a goal. And the second was humility. And and Jim said, when that first came out, he said to his researchers, go back and look at the data. That can't be the second most important characteristic. And they would come back and they say, I'm sorry, Jim, that's what comes out. Because a lot of people think <clears throat> that people with humility, that's the weakness. And yet I think it was C.S. Lewis was the first one to say that people with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. And so I think that the best way to be in the world is to be comfortable with who you are. You know, you're all given some talents and we all have some areas that we could use some help on. And, and if we're <clears throat> comfortable with who we are, uh, then what a difference it can make out there because we can help other people be who they are. Yes. Yes. And it, in a lot of ways, I think you're touching on, <clears throat> um, you know, a very important thing in my life. And so I'm curious, Ken, why do you think it is a challenge for many of us to get comfortable with being who we are as opposed to masquerading or pretending or, 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 or not being accepting of who we are? Well, I think a lot of it, we have a, <clears throat> a self-leadership program and we're now running it out to kids in junior high, high school and, and all. And the first key characteristic is is to get rid of assumed constraints and <clears throat> assumed constraints are things that people tell you about what you can or can't do uh, in life. And, and you take those on rather than saying, wait a minute, you know, I can make some decisions here. It's just like those professors telling me I couldn't write, you know, and, and uh, finally I got an opportunity to write and found out that people kind of loved it because they could understand it because I didn't know any big words. But I, I think it's just getting out of uh, the image that other people have about you and just be comfortable in your own skin. Yes. One of the things that has aided me, and I'd be curious as to your thoughts, is 
when I realized even with people who I was trying to, and I'll put it in the pejorative because I think that's kind of how it was, maybe control what they thought of me or manage what they thought of me because I, I, I thought maybe they were a little more judgmental than I wanted them to be or maybe I was uh, feeling vulnerable or, or maybe even a little shameful about part of myself that I didn't want them to see. And so we've all had people in our lives, certainly I have, where we try to manage or control their impression of us. But the weird thing is you come to this place where you realize even if you try to do that, you can't control what anybody else thinks. <laughs> yes. You know, and one of the things we always go back to is, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt said years ago, nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission, you know? And so if somebody gives you feedback and it's negative, I always like to say, tell me more, you know, can you give me some examples? I'd, I'd love to learn something here. And that always kind of surprises them rather than getting to, defensive, you know, and, uh, and just try to say, how do you learn from, from things and, and, uh, and not argue with, uh, with people and be, be comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And it's amazing how challenging that can be. And, uh, I know for me, uh, the minute I really accepted what I was and what I wasn't and, and, and got on with it, um, that was really the turning point in my own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if we could just tilt back to um, the simple truths for a second, uh, er early in the book, there's this great quote from you that uh, you say, the one thing your competition can't take away from you is the relationship your people have with your customers. Why was it important for you to call that out, particularly early in the book, Ken? Well, um, one of the things that I've found is that all the great companies that I've worked with over the years they think their number one customer is their people. And if you take care of your people, empower your people, love on your people, then what happens is they go and take care of your customers. The number two, the most important customer you have, the people who use your products and services. And they develop that wonderful relationship with them that nobody can take away. And as a result, they start to really become, we call it raving fans of your organization. And why do they become raving fans? It's, it's a one interaction at a time. And it's really interesting. You know, we have, you know, salespeople all over the country and the world in our company. And uh, when somebody leaves a company and goes to another company, they almost always bring our people with them, you know, because they have this great relationship uh, uh, with them. And, and so that's what we, we tell them. It's just about uh, being one good, honest human being to another and not out to try to sell them something they don't need, but find out what they need and see if there's a way you can help them. And if, if you can't, then maybe get them to somebody else. You know, like I wrote a book recently called Servant Leadership in Action, and I got 44 key people in our field to write little short articles. And people said, how did you get those people, you know, like Brene Brown and Simon Sinek and Mark Goldsmith and Francis Hesselbaum and Lori Beth Jones and all kinds of good people because I don't set myself up as competitive with them. I would love to bring out the best in them. That's why I love to co-author books because <clears throat> a lot of times I'm going to somebody saying, here's what I think that you're really known for. Is there a way we could get it out so if even more people could understand it? Like I had a wonderful time working on a book with Bill Onkin, the old monkey management guy, you know, said if a, if a person comes in and works with you and says, boss, we have a problem, watch out, because the monkey's about ready to leap <laughs> from their back <laughs> onto yours, you know, and, and, uh, and watch out, you know, because you end up, you know, in the end, holding their monkey and they walk out completely free and you're now care and feeding uh, their monkey. So uh, it's, it's a, uh, it was just, it's just wonderful to be able to have fun like that. Yeah. It, it is amazing that you uh, ha, ha, have become so known as a collaborator. Yes. It's, uh, it, it's just, it's just, uh, I think just a fun way to, to be, because I think there's wonderful human beings out there and we just need to find out you know, how we can bring out the best in them and they can bring out the best in us. We always feel in our company, one plus one is a lot greater than two. And 
we also argue that no one of us is as smart as all of us. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm curious, you know, having written a book, let me go back to Norman Vincent Peale, another hero of mine. Um, could you tell me about what it was like working with him, writing a book with him, things you uh, learned from him? Well, it's really interesting. You know, a friend of mine told me that if you're going to work with somebody, there's two aspects of it. One is essence and the other is form. In essence, is heart to heart and values to values and form is what are you going to do? He said, be careful with people who want to jump to form right away, because if you don't agree on essence, that form will bite you in the tail. So, and so I was interested in writing a <clears throat> book on the power of positive relationships. And I went to somebody who was kind of known in that field. And all he wanted to do was talk about form, you know, who's going to do what, how are we going to divide the royalties and all. And so I said, you know, pass. And so my publisher said, called me and said, I understand you were disappointed with your meeting. He said, have you ever thought about writing a book with Norman Vincent Peale? And I said, is he still alive? You know, me, my parents had gone to his church before I was born. And they said, he's 86 years old, but he's just unbelievable. And so I went to New York and I met with Norman and Ruth uh, uh, and our publisher for, and our agent for about three hours over a long lunch. And there wasn't one form question. It was all essence. You know, they said, let us tell you about us and we want to find out about you and all. At the end of the lunch, Norman turns to Ruth, who was really one. She had a little pad called Lady Boss. You know, I mean, she kind of ran things, you know. And he said, Ruth, do you think we should write a book with this young man? We hadn't even decided what we were going to write. And she said, absolutely. She said, under one condition. He said, what's that? From now on, when we meet, he will bring his wife, Margie. The four of us will work on this together because they had heard great positive things from our publisher about Margie. And uh, but it was just really special, you know, because they didn't need another book and I didn't need another book. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> it was just uh, wonderful. I would call Norman on the phone and I would say, Norman, I just called you to tell you I loved you. And he said, I was just telling Ruth the other day, the only thing that's wrong with our lives is we don't see Ken and Margie Blanchard enough. You know what I mean? That's just the way he he was, you know, and he was just amazing. He died at 95, and Ruth died at 101. When she was 99, she went to China. She said, I understand a lot of interesting things happening over here. I need to find out about it. Here she is at 99, flying to China, you know what I mean? So she was really amazing. That's so. that's such a great story. Um, and, you know, no surprise, but it's always wonderful to hear that people, people you admire like that were actually that way in person as well. Yes, <laughs> Sometimes, yes. as you know, it's not always the case. It's true, yeah. Now, the other thing I sort of thought about as I was reading your new book um, was the flip side of this, which is – and, you know, you may think I'm a bad person, but I'll, I'll, I'll name some names. You know, if I think about a company like a Comcast uh, or a United Airlines, who, at least in my experience, have notoriously horrible service. And they, they seem to epitomize that, that the opposite of what you're talking about, which is the only people we hate more than our customers are our employees, you know, yeah. just in the way they treat us. So why do you think it's possible in the world that we live in today, you, you lay it out very clearly in the beginning of your book, that having a great product and even at a fair price is not enough, and service is so important, and yet some of these mega corporations uh, still get away with treating us terribly and treating us like a number and not allowing us to talk to people, and some companies you can't even figure out how to get them on the phone, and, and, and so there seems to be some percentage of companies that uh, are going the opposite way. Well, you know, uh, they might be sh uh, successful in the short run, but I don't know if they'll have the long haul kind of thing because it'll eventually catch up with them and they'll lose their best uh, people. And, you know, when I run into organizations like that, uh, the, the key difference is that they have leaders who have big egos and they think that the important thing is you need to suck up the hierarchy, uh, you know, and so if you're dealing with a frontline person and they, and you have a problem rather than taking care of your problem, like at Nordstrom's, you know, their whole philosophy is no problem. Uh, you're talking to a duck, you know, and they go quack, quack. It's our policy. Quack, quack. I just work here. Quack, quack. I didn't make the freaking rules. Quack, quack. Do you want to talk to our policy where, you know, a friend of mine went into Nordstrom's recently to get some perfume for 
his wife and the gal behind the counter said, we don't sell that perfume in our store, but I know where I can get it in the mall. How long are you going to be in the store? He said, oh, about a half an hour. She said, well, fine. I'll go get your perfume in the other store and come back and gift wrap it, have it ready for you when you come back. And it just blew his mind. She had left the store and brought it back and she charged him the same price she paid in the other store. In other words, Nordstrom didn't make any money, but what did they make? They made a customer, see, because if you create a raving fans, then they start telling stories like that uh, about you. And I think the other folks just miss out because people end up telling negative stories of, about them. You know, I mean, you take Southwest versus, you know, you're talking about United and all. And <clears throat> before I even know, knew Herb or Colleen, I had an amazing experience with them. When I travel, I have this... Uh, thing I put around my neck, I call it my geezer pouch, you know, <laughs> when you get old, <laughs> when you get older, you, you lose What's things. What's in your so. geezer pouch? <laughs> well, I put my ticket and my itinerary and pen and pencil and, you know, all that. So, so I go around the airport, what do you need, you know, if I need my passport. <clears throat> so one day I loaded my beauty up and I put it on my, and I left it on my desk and I pull it into the San Diego airport. And I realized I have no official identification. There's a year or two after 9-11, so they're a little uptight about it. So I had to get on a plane. I didn't have time to go back home. So the only book I've written where I have my picture on the cover is I wrote one with Don Shula. I mentioned the Miami Dolphins. They took our picture at Miami Stadium. So ran into the bookstore at the airport, and they happened to have a copy, and so I bought it. And the first airline I had to go to was Southwest, and the guy was checking my bag, and he said, could I see your identification? I said, I feel so badly. I said, I don't have a... Uh, license or a passport, but how's this? And I held a book up and he looked at it and he shouts out, this man knows Don Shula, put him in first class, you know, and they're high-fiving me in the street because I know Don Shula, you know, and there's an older guy there, he said, I know the security guards upstairs and I'll get you through there, and he walked me through the security guards with my book. So the next day, I, uh, before they could get my license to me, I had to go to another one of the biggie airlines, you know, and I showed my book and the duck doo-doo started to fly. You know, the guy says, quack, you better go to the ticket counter. And I showed the book to the ticket counter. She went, quack, you better talk to my supervisor. We call the supervisory uh, uh, manager, the head mallard. They, you know, they just quack at a higher level. And pretty soon I'm, you know, talking to a guy in a suit and a tie. I'm moving up the hierarchy. <laughs> and so I started to give him a hard time. And then I realized that he was a, you know, kind of a bureaucrat. You know, they have kind of very tight underwear. And so I had to change my my tune. And I said, what a difficult job you have. I so appreciate your consideration. You know, so I sucked up the hierarchy and he loved me on the plane. But I had to go through these gyrations, you know. And uh, it really is, uh, is sad, you know. But they don't get it where at Southwest and the great organizations like Nordstrom's and all, they turn the pyramid upside down for, for deliverance and the frontline people are empowered to use their brains. And I, I love, I love that story. And I love everything Southwest. And, uh, I thought, uh, Herb's loss, you know, I didn't know him at all, but, uh, another absolute hero of mine, both as a human being and, and the way he conducted business. And, you know, anybody that's drinking whiskey on the cover of fortune magazine <laughs> is, gonna, is gonna be a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, uh, he's such a uh, character and, when I talked to Colleen after he passed away, she said, Ken, you'll laugh because when we found her, he was lying on the floor and he had cigarettes in one hand. And I said, did he have bourbon in the other hand? She said, no, but I thought he would. He had a, had a magazine that he was reading or something, you know, but, <laughs> but he was just a, just a delight and, uh, and just created that uh, whole concept. You know, one of their, uh, Four values is is a fun loving attitude, and that was Herb, you know. And a friend was flying Southwest a while back, and the stewardess got on the thing and said, "This is the last flight of the day, and we're really tired. And we don't have the energy to pass out the peanuts and the and the pretzels and and all. So we're going to put them on the floor up front, and when we take off and get some height, they'll come down the aisle, and you can grab them, <laughs> you know. And everybody's laughing and having a wonderful time." <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is amazing that difference. I, I had a recent uh, super positive experience with the folks at Patagonia, uh, a brand that I respect and admire tremendously. Yvonne Chouinard, their founder, is, I think, a, 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 a beacon of 
of what's possible with entrepreneurship. And um, so long story longer, Ken, I had this Patagonia puffer jacket that I've had for the better part of 15 years. And it's been on many hikes and ski adventures with me and it's all beaten up and my wife wants me to get rid of it. But I just, there's just so much good mojo in that jacket. Sure, I just, yeah. Anyway, you don't want to ever get rid of it. <laughs> absolutely not. I don't care how, you know, how, how it looks. And, and so the zipper started to go on it. And I knew they had a program that you could come back in and they would um, put a new zipper on for a small fee or whatever. So I, there's a Patagonia store in Santa Cruz. So I went down there with my jacket. And um, the young man behind the counter just said, well, you know, maybe give me a few minutes and I'll, I'll – um, you know, you look around the store, whatever you want to do. And let me see if I, I think I might be able to fix this. And of course, sure enough, you know, he fixes my, uh, my jacket and a jacket that's had, you know, plus or minus 15 years worth of use. Um, they just fix on the spot for me. They don't charge me a dime and, and kind of away you go. And you sort of think, first of all, you know, just like your Nordstrom story. I mean, it's an incredible thing. And second of all, it does lead you to a place that says, you know, this is so awesome. Why can't more companies just do this? Sure, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And so what is it you think that really separates the legendary customer service companies, you know, the, the Southwest, the Nordstrom's, uh, the Patagonia's, and so many others from, you know, the meaningful percentage of companies that seem to not really, uh, <coughs> not really care at all? Well, I, I think is that they intuitively understand servant leadership. You know, when I talk to people about servant leadership, they often think I'm talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please everybody. But they don't understand that there's, there's two parts of servant leadership. There's vision, direction, values, and goals. You know, leadership's about going somewhere. And that's the responsibility of the traditional hierarchy. And it doesn't mean they don't involve people in determining those and all, but that's the leadership part of servant leadership. And once vision, direction, values, and goals and all are clear, then the great ones just philosophically understand they turn the pyramid upside down. And now the top managers are at the bottom of the hierarchy and everybody is working for everybody who eventually works uh, for the customer. And, uh, and they might not even call that servant leadership, but they just get it because they know that that uh, probably the most important person in the organization is the frontline person who's either answering the phone or greeting people or, or that kind of thing. And uh, in our uh, office, our headquarter building, we got about five buildings. If you walk in, there's the uh, folks there that answer the phone and greet people. And uh, they have a sign because we let people decide what they want to be called. And they call that themselves the... Uh, uh, directors of first impressions, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that's really, really true. So I think it's pretty powerful. I love it. And if I was somebody, maybe I'm a, a business owner or a CEO or some kind of a, a leader. And I said to you, you know, Ken, I've been doing some soul searching and I would like to become a person that other people view as a role model in servant leadership. What would you share with me as sort of a, a way to um, educate myself and conduct myself to become a legendary servant leader? Well, first of all, you have to declare it. You know, you have to set the vision. Is that to me, the customers are all important and I want us to be legendary in our customer service. So it starts with a vision. And then uh, then you say, and, and what I want to do is empower you all particularly the ones in front of the customers to bring your brains to work. You know, I mean, like my story with Southwest, you know, the guy didn't assume that I had superimposed my picture on the book to get by, by them, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so uh, it, it's just, uh, it's the vision. And then sort of say, here it is. And what I want to do is wander around and cheer you all on, you know, and, uh, and if, if I'm not, doing that, then give me feedback, you know, tell me to get out of the way, you know, because uh, that, that's what it is. So it's, it takes vision and direction and values and then uh, behavior, you know, you have to walk your talk. Yes. Now, speaking of talking, um, a lot of people, it seems today, want to be better public speakers. I believe that uh, <clears throat> as a leader, as anybody who's trying to um, communicate ideas, 
becoming a speaker, even if it's not something you do professionally, uh, is a very powerful thing to, uh, to have as a skill set. Uh, you can use it in your family. I've married m multiple members of my family, and that's a super fun thing to do. Isn't that fun? I've done a bunch of weddings, too. I bet you have. I yeah. bet you're fantastic at it. And Any recently, Ken? Uh, yeah, we, well, I've done several people up at the, at the company and we do it in our backyard of our house. <laughs> we got a nice step scene, come on with down to the lawn and, <clears throat> and it's, and it's really fun. And I even volunteered to be the interim pastor in our church when the, the pastor left. And I did it cause we had two young, great young pastors. Nobody had ever heard and an Egyptian pastor was the best Bible teacher I ever heard. And the only one they ever heard was the executive uh, pastor and I came in and I said, you know, we're going to, uh, every five weeks, one of us can preach, you know, and I think one of the reasons not much leadership in church is try to give 45 speeches a year to the same audience, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a you little know. daunting. Yeah. You don't have any time for leadership, you know, <laughs> and, you know, start getting some of your people in your congregation to share too, you know, it's just, uh, it's not all about you. So if I if I said to you, hey Ken, I want to I want to become a legendary speaker. I want to be uh, I want to learn 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 from you. If if I could call you a Yoda of speaking, so to speak, haha. <laughs> um, what would you guide me to if I wanted to improve my skills as a as a public speaker, whether it's doing weddings or speaking at church or keynoting at a business conference? Well, first of all, I would I would go and join. Uh, What's that? The, the speakers group that you can like get Toastmasters or something. Toast, like that. Toastmasters, one of those things where you get opportunities because I think it's a number of times at bat that really uh, helps you, you know. And so uh, whenever you get a chance to get on your feet, uh, do it. And my father was a great public speaker, and he told me, he said, Ken, the key to being a good public speaker is make a point, tell a story. Make a point, tell a story, you know. He said, nobody likes to hear just one point after a point. And I remember when I, I told you I ran for the president in the seventh grade and won. And when they introduced me, uh, I stood up and, and I said, here's a little kid in the seventh grade. I said, as the cow said to the farmer when the milking machine broke down, thanks for that warm hand. You know, and the, place, <laughs> the place just cracked up, you know, this little kid, you know, because my father gave me that story, you know. And, and that was the beginning of, uh, of that. And so I got a chance to, you know, speak a lot as a, as a youth, you know, you know, running for office and things like that. But it's just a matter of, of, of practice and, uh, and uh, Toastmasters and any of those things are really uh, fun, fun places to, to begin. So lo lots of trips to the plate. That's right. And how did you develop? And, you know, that story you just told is a great example. You're well known for having a, a fantastic sense of humor uh, through some stories uh, that it may be a little quirky every once in a while. Uh, and so how do you sort of perfect using your humor? Well, I think you, you kind of look for the, the humor and things, you know, like I, when I said, you can always tell a bureaucrat, they have really tight underwear. <clears throat> I mean, people start to laugh, you know, that, that, that's, that's one that it, makes me want to pee a little in my <laughs> underwear when you say yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, so true. <laughs> Yeah, because it really is, you know, and uh, so like I was talking to a church group the other day and I I said, you know, I just don't dig the concept of calling people a sinner. I mean, I said, have any of you ever called a friend a sinner? And they say, thanks for sharing. Appreciate the feedback. <laughs> you know, they attack you back, you know, and uh, so that, uh, you know, you don't want to call people a sinner, but you want to say, you know, here's something I've noticed, you know, and. And I don't know whether it's important to you and all, but I, th I thought I'd share it if it's okay and ask their permission to give them some feedback, you know, and, and, uh, but just don't attack, uh, people, but people laugh when you say, you know, call them a sinner. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't need to share anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the other sort of question in the same vein is, you know, is one of the top writers ever, um, in the Amazon Hall of Fame, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so many people today want to write books. It's e it's easier than ever. The folks at Amazon make it super easy to self-publish. Uh, my first book was published traditionally, and my second one was self-published. 
And I get asked this question all the time, but I'm not you. So I want to ask the, the question of you. If I'm somebody that wants to write, um, what advice would you give me in becoming a successful writer? Well, one of the things is that you don't necessarily have to write, you know, like I run to people and they're all thinking about God, I'm sitting there and all. I said, no, if you got something to say, why don't you get some kind of recording machine and, and get a group of people and give them a speech and then have somebody type it up and then give it to an editor and start to, to hone it down. You know, I mean, because what you're really doing is if you want to have a good book, you want to share something that comes as we said earlier from your heart and uh and don't you know sit there like you're some big scholar and also i mean i don't sit there like this i i dictate i walk around the room or and have people come and sit in the back and you know, get an idea of things and when i go to a person uh, you know about writing a book i i say you know what what, what would what concepts would you like to tell people and i get a recorder out you know and then people tell me what's important to them. And then we say, okay, I wonder if there's a story we can develop around that because uh, I got really interested in the whole parable writing. I mean, we met Spencer Johnson at a cocktail party. I had uh, gone out to San Diego on a one year sabbatical leave from the University of Massachusetts. And and uh, that was 42 years ago, I just never went back. But, but early on, we were invited to a cocktail party by Adelaide Brie who wrote visualizations directing the movies of your mind one of the first people on self-healing of cancer and she invited authors and i had a textbook you know that i wrote with paul hersey when we were at ohio university it was the first thing i ever wrote and uh so i got invited and margie met spencer and he wrote all these wonderful children's books value tales the value of honesty story of abe lincoln the value of determination story of helen keller and she hand carried him over to spencer and to me and said, you guys ought to write a children's book for managers. They won't read anything else. <laughs> and so Spencer was a children's book writer and I'm a storyteller. And so he was working on a one minute scolding with a psychiatrist. And I invited him to a seminar I was doing. And he sat in the back and laughed and came running up at the end. He said, forget parenting. Let's do the one minute manager, you know. And we decided that we would make a story. And, you know, I've been telling various stories and and so I just found out that people love to learn. My father always said, you know, uh, you know, make a point, tell a story, you know, the people love stories. You know? Yeah. And is that what motivates you to keep going? Yes. It's just really fun for, for me. I'm sorry to work on a book now called duh. Uh, why, why is in common sense, common practice? Just cause we were asking, you know, because people say who practices what you preach? I said, well, only the leaders like Nordstrom's and Southwest Airlines and Wegmans and Grocery and Disney and Entertainment and uh, Sonovas and Financial Services, you know, and, and all. And I'm so going, duh, why doesn't other people uh, do it? You know, for example, uh, if you said, Ken, I'm going to take everything away for, that you've taught with for over years, all the years and all your books, what would you want to hold on to last? I would say the second secret of the woman, a manager, the key to developing people in a great organization is to wander around, see if you can catch people doing something right. And yet when I go into organizations around the world, I'll say to people, how do you know whether you're doing a good job? Number one response is nobody's yelled at me lately. You know, and no news is good news, you know, and nobody's catching them doing anything right. You know, the most popular leadership style around the world, I call seagull management, you know, you, Somebody gives you a goal and they disappear and then they find something wrong and they fly in, make a lot of noise, dump on everybody and then fly out, you know. And uh, so that's the kind of stuff that they go, duh. I mean. So your next book's going to be called Duh. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> you know, we never know what's coming up. So it's that's just a, really, really fun, you know, because people say, why you keep on writing? I mean, this year is the 59th anniversary of my 21st birthday, you know, and uh they said, when are you going to stop writing? I said, I don't know when he takes me up, you know, because uh, <laughs> why would you stop doing what's fun? You know, I mean, uh, you never have to work a day in your life if you enjoy what you're doing. And I, you, you look like you really enjoy what you're doing. I do. Actually, I have thought about this uh, over the last several months um, since I've become a writer and, and a podcaster. Uh, people ask me, well, you know, how much time do you spend working or how much work is your podcast? How, you know, how, how much work do you put into it? And 
uh, of course, I understand what they're asking. I'm not uh, a moron, or at least a complete one anyway. But <laughs> to your point, I – and you know, I don't always feel this way every day, but most days I feel, well, I think how you're describing, which is they sort of, I need a new word for this because, you know, the two books that I've written, the, you know, we do two to three episodes a week of this podcast. Uh, and, 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 you know, I still do a little bit of uh, coaching advisory work with companies. And so, you know, I only do things that I really love to do and hopefully things that are going to make some kind of a difference in the world. And I think when you do that, you need a different word for it because it, 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 Look, having a conversation with Ken Blanchard is not something that I will ever describe to anybody as the work I did today. <laughs> yeah, no, it really is true. You know, I mean, <clears throat> people ask me, you know, uh, would you do a podcast? You're, hey, I love to talk to people, you know, and share stuff. And I learn <clears throat> from them, too. You know, it's a uh, I wrote a book on mentoring with uh, Claire Diaz Cortez and and. Uh, Every time you mentor or help somebody else, you learn too. You know, it's always a two-way street, you know, so it's not a, not that. And I love your office, you know, I mean, you obviously like music and, and all that kind of stuff. So, wow. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've always believed that your environment is important. Um, and I, the longer I've lived, the more I see that to be true, that, that we want to be in a physical space that is kind of uh, empowering to us, that is fun. And, and, um, and so, and I also have an incredibly creative, loving, supportive wife. And so when we started the podcast um, and created this studio, uh, we began to think about, okay, so what are things that would be fun and, and kind of enlivening and, and, mm -hmm. and create the right environment? And she worked closely with me and put all this together. So uh, thank you for your kind comment. Yeah, you know, it really is <clears throat> fun. And, you know, talk about marriage, every decent marriage, I think I run into the, the husband thinks that they married above themselves, you know, and uh, then you got a relationship. You know, we went back to our 55th reunion a while back and and people still were coming up and saying, how did you ever talk Margie into marrying you? you know, I said, uh, I don't know. I was, must have been quick afoot, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I duped but, her that uh, one day and I somehow got around. <clears throat> you know, the fun of this, uh, I, I just remember they said, now the camera's up there. I, I keep on talking to you, so I'm probably going to be talking on the thing down because I'm, I'm looking at you because it's No, fun. you look great, Ken. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing, you know, and maybe we could touch on this uh, as well, if you're okay going here. I, I had a friend who was um, recently having a challenge in his uh, in his marriage, and uh, he was asking me sort of, you know, what he should do with his wife and going through some of the specifics. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's all interesting, those specifics, but maybe just try this. Try treating her like a queen. Mm -hmm. Just, just. Yeah. Just love the shit out of her and see That's what right. happens. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. The, the male role models I have for being husbands are speak the way you do. Yes. They just, they, they, and worship, maybe not the right uh, sort of word because I don't want it to sound subservient or that it's not a partnership. Cause of course it's it admi admiring really. It's, you know. Yes. And <laughs> yes. so could, could you maybe unpack a little bit about marriage for me? Well, you know, what happens with marriage is really interesting. When you fall in love, everything's right. You know, like, oh, God, you know, your friends might say, I don't even think she's right. Oh, God, you know, and then you move in with them and you go, what the hell is that? I mean, you got to be kidding. And all of a sudden you start accenting the negative, you know, and people say, well, how do you turn a marriage around? And I said, you know, start catching them doing something right. You know, Margie says that we finally had a really good marriage after 10 years uh, because uh, she decided she was going to fall in love with the total package that was Ken Blanchard, all the things she loved about me and even the things that bugged her about me, you know, because <laughs> we all have shortcomings, you know, and it's really interesting when you're un when you're married, unconditionally, you you're loved unconditionally you start even working on some of the things that, that might bug other people, you know, but when you're criticized and all, then you get defensive and all that kind of thing. It's so it's a, it's really the uh, catching each other, doing things right, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, 
I'll say to Margie, I hope I don't tell you I love you too much, do I? You know, she says, no, keep it coming, you know. (laughs) You know, I've heard some people say, oh, you know, if you tell your spouse or your kids or who, you know, maybe even people you work with that you love them too much, it it, it loses its power and you shouldn't say it so much. And and I don't know. I'm kind of with you. I, 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 I don't subscribe to that kind of thinking. No, not at all. I mean, why wouldn't you want to keep on saying as long as it's it's sincere and it's not just, you know, words. And then you've, you know, kind of don't come home or don't give them any time, you know. But but if you follow it up, you know, you have to walk your talk. Yeah, I, I love this thing. I'm going to treat, treat Margie as a queen. Yeah, you know? she yeah. sounds like she is a queen. She is. And I'm going to even treat her like a bigger queen. Yeah. Wh- <laughs> why not? Why not just blow her away? And, you know, I even yeah. find by way of example with my guy friends, you know, uh, not maybe every time, but and it may sound corny to some. But at the end of a conversation, I'll say, hey, man, I love you. Yeah, no, it's really, a, you know, people are afraid to use that word, uh, word love, you know, and uh, I'll say I, I leave a morning message for everybody in our company every day. Uh, and, uh, I, I do three things. One, I tell people who to pray for. We got every faith and non-faith, but if somebody's got a mother that's hurting her kid and all, and I say, we got over 300 people and we got a lot of power of, uh, examples of when people send positive energy towards people. Then I praise people. People tell me who are unsung heroes or people have done special things. And then I leave an inspirational message around something I've heard or read recently. I got a letter a while back from a guy from New Zealand who I met in an airport, and I sent him some books, and he wrote me a note. And he said, Ken, you know the business you're in is teaching people the power of love rather than the love of power. And I went, whoa, isn't that a great statement, you know? I mean, and uh, so I, I just really think that. I mean, if you don't love your people, well, get a life. Go do something else, you know? Be an individual contributor. <laughs> yeah, go find a hole or something. I, I, I don't understand that part either. And I, I, I've also uh, never understood this. Uh, well, it's just business. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's all, I mean, look, and some people really disagree with me, but for me, it's all personal. Yes. And when you look at the data that it says it's 60 or 70% of the work population feel disengaged and, and not you say, wow, I mean, what, what are we doing in these organizations, you know? And uh, so we, we need to have fun. We had a wonderful day yesterday. We call it Blanchard Live Connect. And, and when we when we ha- doing really well, we bring everybody uh, to San Diego and or Escondido where our office is. And, and, but when, you know, things are tough well, a little bit, you know, they're tough now, we do it on line and everything and it's just fun and we we have a people's choice awards where people get to you know uh identify people as the you know the 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 best one minute manager the the uh kindest person the you know this and and uh the most values led person and and god everybody we you know get over 600 <coughs> people sending in nominations you know 600 nominations and when we you know build that up and that's just so much fun to see uh people get cheered on by their colleagues and it's like the, the academy awards and we say and the finalists you know and <laughs> the drum and then the winner you know <clears throat> and it's a uh, it's just fun you know uh people are beautiful it, if you uh, give them a chance to be beautiful yes and i love the celebratory nature of the story you just shared yes um, yeah. we just had a new baby in our family. My niece gave birth to a baby girl. And, um, one of the things I find fun today is there's, you know, a baby shower, which of course has been around for a long time, but yeah. there's this thing that's emerged more recently over the last, you know, I don't know, I'm not, I don't pay close attention to these sorts of things, but over the last decade or so, these gender reveal parties, uh-huh. Uh, where, you know, the, the, somebody finds out what the sex of the baby is going to be and then they throw, sort of throw a party to tell the whole family. And uh, somebody uh, in my family who remained nameless sort of said something about, you know, why is Holly having this party? We, she's got a baby shower and now we have to go to this thing and, and just sort of being a curmudgeon about it. And I said, you know what? When a wonderful couple who love each other uh, and want to have a baby – 
and are you know are going to be good parents. And if, if they want to celebrate this multiple times, then let's have as many parties around this topic as they want to sure. have because there's so much that's not great in our world when there are legendary things like a wonderful young couple having a baby. Uh, and, and you want to moan and groan about having a second party over this topic? I think that's ridiculous. Let's have as many yeah. parties as the couple wants to have. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's just a uh, fun celebration is a wonderful uh, concept, you know, to just to just to have fun, you know, I just uh, just uh, love that kind of thing. And, and to uh, one of our people made a sign and put it in our house. It's called <clears throat> the Blanchard Inn. Because, you know, salespeople or people come out of time, they'll call and say, is there any room at the Blanchard Inn, you know? And, and uh, we just love to have people stay with us. My wife is just uh, great. She was the president of the company for years. She has a PhD in communication. And she's much better at that kind of thing. I'm I'm the chief spiritual officer. I cheerlead people on, you know. It's just a fun in our daughter runs our marketing department our son runs all works in the product development and is a great consultant and margie's brother who was born when she was a freshman at cornell he's our ceo and chairman uh you know and so we have a family council that meets you know once a quarter for a whole day with an outside consultant we've been doing that for over 20 years from which the the kids and margie's brother joined the the company we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year i mean wow. how many when, how when is that ken it's uh well it's in the fall and uh so it's the 40th anniversary of my 80th birthday so we're gonna have a number of parties and if people say there's too many parties celebrating this one then they're crazy <laughs> i'm with you 40th anniversary you said it's going to be your 80th birthday yeah that's right uh, I, yeah. I think you should spend the entire the the back half of the year celebrating. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it really is. You know, people say, oh, "Aren't you concerned about your age?" I said, "No, I'm just I'm having so much fun." You know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I hope I can go another twenty twenty five years. They're talking about now that the first person who's going to live to one hundred and twenty is is was born. You know, so I think the. The longer you stay alive, the better chance you got to stay alive. I mean, I yes. got do- I have doctors for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got physical physical fitness coaches, you know, to help me, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, well, and, and why not? It's so interesting how your relationship with age can be transformed. My um, father in law is eighty eight years old, and uh, he's a farmer. And uh-huh. he still spends uh, plus or minus five or six hours, five to six days a week in his orchard, taking yeah. care of his fruit trees. And he's as fit and as capable as ever. And uh, to, to your point, he's had some specialists who've helped him with various things along the way to make sure, sure. That he's still in good shape. That's right. But here's a man in his late 80s looking at 90, and he's yeah. as physically active as you can imagine, and he's connected to the world, and he cares about his community, and he's very involved with his church, and, and so forth and so on. And, and when you have great examples like that in your life, to your point, you think, well, why wouldn't I want to do that well into past sure. 100th birthday if I could, yeah. right? I mean, when I think about Norman Vincent Peale and Ruth, I mean, what a great model, because when Margie and I met them, we were in our 40s, you know, and they they were in their 80s, you know, and now we're we're catching up. And uh, I got to give a speech for Guideposts, you know, their magazine that's still going strong this year and tell stories about Norman and Ruth and everybody just loved that, you know, to hear hear those stories. And, and, uh, so, uh, my wife has, Margie has a favorite saying, she said, aging, aging is a, is a privilege denied to many. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and as somebody who fairly recently celebrated my 50th birthday, I've, I've had to sort of tune myself to that, that like, Hey, um, you know, like I hurt my knee recently and it's taken way longer to heal than I would have liked. Mm-hmm. It's sort of yeah. held, me, held me back doing my normal physical things that I like to do. But I, I, I have to remind myself that uh, it is a privilege denied to many, isn't it? And so yeah, well, you have to slow down on your knee every once in a while. And you have to have fun, you know, because I hobble a little bit because I've got two new hips and they want to now operate on my knees and all that. And they say, where, where did you get the knee problems? I said, well, I, I was a basketball player when I was young and I used to hit my knee on the rim a lot. And that really was a problem. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then people look at me, you know, start to laugh. <laughs> so I said it wasn't the rim that was a problem. It was coming down. <laughs> well, Ken, I, I, look, I could talk to you for uh, the next 15 hours, but I, I want to be super respectful of your time. Are there any other things that you'd like to touch on? Well, I just would say that this simple truce of service with uh, Barbara Glantz is just a wonderful, fun story about Johnny the Bagger. And then I make a bunch of observations about service. And it's a nice little book you can pass along. That's how I met Colleen Barrett uh, for the first time, because a guy in our shipping department called me and said, we just got an order for 30,000 copies of the simple truce of service. I said, from whom? He said, Colleen Barrett, the president of Southwest Airlines, you know. <laughs> and so I called her, you know. And I said, well, she said, I just think that's a wonderful little book. I wanted to buy one for everybody in the company, you know. <laughs> and so I flew down to meet her, and she was just was such a joy. And then I got to meet Herb and, and all that kind of thing. And so it's, a, it's just a wonderful pass-along book. And well, Barbara Glanz is, is one of the great speakers in the, in the country. Barbara, you, you really enjoy hearing her. I, I'll look out for her for sure. And I would love to welcome her on the podcast if you think. Yeah, she, she would be great. Yeah. The other thing I thought was absolute genius about your book is at the very front here, you have a to and a from. So you have set this thing up on the very first page to be a gift from me to somebody in my life. It's a very That's wise right. thing to do. You, you've learned a few things about writing books, haven't you? Sure, yes. You know, Because <laughs> the big thing, and uh, you know, people say, how do you get a best-selling book? Well, it's not publicity and all that. It's pass along. You know, I mean, you know, that young kid who said his grandfather gave the one minute manager of his father. I mean, what made that book so successful, you know, I don't know how many millions of copies so is that people would say, I want to I want to share that with other people. And that's what's happening. This is a new edition of The Simple Truth, which is, uh, you know, not much new in it, but just a new design that we think is even more inviting because we want to really kind of, you know, share that with uh, with people. Well, and I love you've made it, you know, I would call it. Um, super consumable. I mean, there's yes. all these wonderful photos and pull out quotes and, uh, you know, it's a great size, you know, it's not a giant book, so you can slip it into your briefcase and it's not going to take up a lot of space. If you're somebody yes. like me who prefers the physical uh, book versus the digital book. And so you've just present everything about it makes it easy to consume. It's not a thick book. You know, it's everything about sure, it. Yeah. Hey, pick me up and, and look at me. Yes. And so that's uh, I like to always write short books. This servant leadership in action is the biggest because I got 44 contributors. But I said to them, the problem with most reading books, the articles are too long. And so I don't want your article to be more than six or seven pages. So Renee Broadwell, who was my co-editor, we honed down all these articles. So I tell people it's a great bathroom book because you can read a six page article while you're sitting there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and there are some of us who do like to do that in the bathroom oh yeah i got some of my best reading stuff there <laughs> yeah and, and i'm old school i'd rather read a book in the bathroom than my iphone <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> anything else you'd like to touch on ken no i just uh think that life is a very special occasion and i hope people figure a way out to uh to really enjoy it, you know, and uh, because, uh, you know, we're only here for a period of time and you might as well make the most of it. And, and uh, Margie always says, you know, when we die, I, I hope that we're the last people to learn that we were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm hoping it's going to be a good deal afterwards too. And, well, uh, Ken, I, you know, I can't thank you enough. You're an incredible inspiration. Your contributions are literally incalculable. Your contribution to me is a huge one, and I'm grateful. And so thank you for your writing. Thank you for being with me today. And I am going to push my luck uh, and invite you to come back um, a little later on in the year as you're celebrating the 40th and the 80th. Uh, and maybe we could spend a little bit of time on that if I could if I could be as uh, bold as to ask you for a little mo- more of your time a little down sure. the road. Sure. <clears throat> that will be fun, you know, because it's going to be a fun, fun year. Yeah. And, uh, so uh, life is, I said, a special occasion. And so <clears throat> I'm, I'm 
I'm ready to celebrate. We're going to celebrate everything we can. Fantastic. Ken, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Good to be with you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Whew. Dr. Ken Blanchard. Dr. Ken Blanchard. Wow. You know, I just feel so privileged. I know if you're a regular listener, you hear me say this. So privileged to have these conversations and be able to share them with you. And in a case like this, to meet and hang out with one of my business heroes and, and true thought leaders. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Now, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. And today, more than ever, being on top of the seminal strategic numbers that drive your growth and drive your business is absolutely critical. That's where my friends at NetSuite come in. NetSuite is the number one uh, platform for growth for entrepreneurial businesses. They are the leader in cloud ERP, the category king, if you will. And imagine having every critical number you need to manage and grow your business on your smartphone, anywhere, anytime. NetSuite can make that happen for you. Um, they have amazing dashboards that allow you to stay on top of all of the critical parts of your business. Uh, sales, orders, finance, accounting, receivables, payables, inventory, and even HR. Thousands of the best known brands and fastest growing companies use NetSuite to manage and grow their business. And now it's available to you at a surprisingly cost-effective price. So uh, what they're offering and have been for a while is uh, as a listener to this podcast, you can set up a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry to talk about opportunities for growth uh, in your business. So I'd encourage you to check out netsuite.com slash different. That's netsuite.com slash different. All right. We would like to thank the amazing new book by uh, our friend and guest today, the incredible the Hall of Fame Amazon writer, one of the most important thinkers in business history, Ken Blanchard. The new book is called The Simple Truths of Service. It's a great read. It's a wonderful little book. It's really well put together. It's easy to consume, The Simple Truths of Service. Uh, the amazing folks at OneLifeFullyLive.org. This is the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. The number one, LifeFullyLive.org. The incredible Flourishing Leadership Institute. These are the folks that help you facilitate positive change in your business. Check out the word lead, the number two, flourish.com today. Um, now, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an entrepreneurial person and you're committed to uh, both business and personal growth, why not check out one of my favorite places on the internet today, the new growwire.com. It's what legendary entrepreneurial people are reading. Uh, there's great stories of innovation. There's a podcast there. There's a YouTube channel there and a ton of awesome content, growwire.com. Now, you may know in the podcast world, we don't have a lot of great analytics, but um, uh, here's what we think's going on. We think we have a growing audience in Ireland. So if you're in Ireland, I want to say hello. And if you want to do legendary marketing in Ireland, my friends at Fusion PR, Fusion Marketing and Fusion Graphic Design, Fusion, um, they're the ones that do legendary marketing in Ireland. So check out Fusion, F-U-Z or Z, depending on your beliefs, <laughs> I-O-N dot I-E today for legendary marketing in the beautiful country of Ireland. And speaking of entrepreneurship, if you want to help um, small e entrepreneurs in the developing world with uh, uh, no cost loans, that is to say interest free loans, check out the amazing nonprofit Kiva, K I V A dot O R G today. All right, I need to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes, and this oddcast is a sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. All rights do remain disturbed. Warning this oddcast can be contagious. Be nice to your mother. Don't forget to teach legendary customer service, support your local entrepreneurs, buy John's crazy socks, tell two people you love about two podcasts you love, don't be lame, get out of the passing lane, remember the sage words of Leonard Cohen who said, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in, only buy pasture-raised, free-range eggs, thank you Candy Dandy, I love you mom and dad, and hey Colin. This oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Kim Kardashian. Sorry, Kimmy. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with me. Uh, and until we're together again, follow your different.